I think we may get started. Would that be all right? Um, yeah. Are we having that? And then people, I know Julian's going to be a few minutes late, but um, uh, we'll get going if you may. Um, so welcome. I've got a, a few words under the welcome. Um, uh, first of all, to thank Susanna Rose for her contribution to the trust. I don't know whether Susanna's actually on the, on the call, but it would be her last uh, uh, meeting. Uh, and Elaine Williams, who many of you will know, is um, taking over as the Red Cross representative. Uh, and Aileen is uh, uh, retiring from the trust, so we'll be look forward to seeing Aileen in the future. Uh, uh, Guy Dakin is also the staff governor is taking up his duties again. He's come back after a period uh, of a career break. Oh, okay. um, Stephen Gillingwater uh, emailed all the hospital, all the governors about being in the hospital, and I'm sure we all wish him a speedy recovery. Um, and I think as this is Paul's last meeting, uh, certainly last meeting of the governor, I think, I think we should uh, express our appreciation, Paul, for all you've done for the for the trust over nine years, I think it is. And I think five or six years as lead governor, I can't remember, but I've certainly very much valued your uh, contribution, your guidance, and to get the governors you know, feeling that they're able to contribute properly and to get the trust to respond properly to governors. So thank you very much, Paul, for that. Yeah, thank, um, thanks for your word, Martin, but I'm I'm uh, still a governor for almost another year. Another year, but you're not so league you governor. You haven't got rid of me yet. No, no, no. I wasn't trying to get rid of you. Honestly, just <laughs> but but, but uh, as league governor. At, uh, as league governor. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So thank you for that. Um, apologies for absence, Julie. Yeah, we've got um, Brian Bridgman, John Jarvis, Stephen Gillywater, Deborah Alcock Taylor, June Carmichael, Ray Buckland, and Natasha Bertollier. Okay. Thanks for that. But, Declarations of any interest? Minutes of the last formal meeting, any corrections? OK, so um, if we go on to item five, uh, mental health support in schools and Louise, are you on the call somewhere? You are? I, I can yes, see you. Yeah. <laughs> so Louise, over to you, really. This is your head of CAM, so we look Good. forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Are you OK if I share my screen, then I Please. can just share a presentation with you? Thanks. Yeah, that's fine. Check that you can all see that now. Yeah, yeah. I will share it like that because it means I can still see you rather than actually just putting it as a formal presentation, if that's OK because um, then I can see if anybody's got questions. Um, so my name's Louise Noble, I'm the head of CAMS and the All Age Eating Disorder Service for Berkshire Healthcare. So thank you very much for um, asking me to talk to you today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the school's mental health support teams or MHSTs. Um, I thought that you might find it helpful to just have a little bit of a summary of the NHS long term plan targets that relate to CAMS. Um, so we have a number of targets that relate to CAMS. We have a four week wait. Um, we have a number of four week waiting pilots. There's um, specific targets that relate to eating disorders, the development of crisis services for children and young people, whole pathways relating to inpatient beds and kind of new models of care for providing that intensive level of care for children and young people. Um, targets around extending digital therapies, um, access, increasing the numbers of children and young people who are able to access NHS evidence based mental health services and then some wider commitments that relate to the youth justice service um, reducing waiting times for children with learning disabilities and autism um, and children with complex difficulties and complex trauma um, and Berkshire Healthcare CAMS are involved in all of those with the exception of the four week wait pilots we did put forward some proposals around that, but weren't successful. Oxford Health were, um, and so we've been quite closely involved with them in terms of the learning that's coming up of those pilots. Um, so if I just focus on the MHSTs today. So um, what is a mental health support team? Well, it, they're NHS funded teams, um, including a new workforce who provide interventions um, and support a whole school approach for young people with mild to moderate mental health difficulties within schools um, and they work as part of an integrated approach to mental health care. 
So there are a number of kind of key principles that apply to all of the MHSTs. They have to cover a population of approximately 8,000 children and young people, um, which in most areas relates to around 16 schools, obviously varies a little bit. Um, there's an expectation that they will deliver around 500 interventions per year, interventions not just individual <laughs> treatment, but kind of teaching and, and various different types of support. They should be additional to and integrated with other services that are already existing in schools and locally to support children and children and young people's emotional well-being and mental health. And that's really important. They're not meant to replace things that are already existing that may be being cut or moved in order to kind of redivert resources. They need to be responsive to individual schools. So there is a model, there is a national model that was developed out of trailblazer programmes that, that is prescriptive to a degree, but they do need to be responsive to the individual needs of local schools. Um, and it's well recognised that there isn't one size fits all. Um, although they are a school based service, they should be supporting the children and young people who are who are part of that school community. And that means that they should be operating all year, not just term time only. And they should co-produce their approach and their service offer with service users. So that includes young people, parents, carers, um, staff working within the schools um, and other local colleagues. Um, the NHS long term plan target is at the moment that between 20 and 25 percent of schools across the country should have an MHST by 2023. Um, and these, these are nationally funded through NHS England. In Berkshire East, we have four teams. So we have two in Slough, one in Bracknell and one in RBWM. In Berkshire West, we have five, two in Reading, two in West Berkshire and one in Wokingham. Um, and that gives you the sort of approximate coverage across the, the Berkshire East and Berkshire West areas. So we're actually doing pretty well here. Um, of course, the problem is that we still have then a percentage of schools that don't have access to an MHST. Um, and we are working to try and find ways of supporting those children and those schools. But, but the national funding hasn't flowed yet to allow us to have any more teams than those. Um, do you want me to take questions as we go along, Martin, or do you want to say? Well, to... if it's if, uh, if I think if it's relevant to Paul. Yeah, just just on that slide, Louise, um, it says 40 percent coverage and 45 percent. Is that 40 percent of the 20 to 25 percent target or is that 40 no, percent of all schools? It's 40 percent of all schools. OK, so yeah. it's well above the target, in fact. Yeah. So we are we are above the target. Um, at you. the moment, so we've done pretty well in terms of um, obtaining that funding. Yeah. Um, and we've got we have different models in Berkshire East and Berkshire West, um, which is about the way that the CCGs have chosen to commission these services. So for Berkshire East, we are the providers of the MHST teams. For Berkshire West, the CCGs made a decision to commission the local authorities to provide those services. Um, so we provide some clinical input because part of the national model is that that's mandated. Um, but Berkshire West were a trailblazer for this programme and so they chose to commission differently. So we have very slightly different models across the county. Um, so, I mean, this is a really, really busy slide and I won't read the detail, but but basically, this is, um, just sort of summarises how we allocate um, schools to an MHST team. Um, so initially, the rollout was through an expression of interest for this trailblazer phase. So Berkshire West CCG and our kind of local transformation plan and system group, which we're part of, applied and were successful. Berkshire East, and again, we were part of that decision, made a, made the decision not to apply for the trailblazer phase because they didn't feel that they were ready as a system to be able to progress. Um, and what they wanted was to learn from the trailblazers and be prepared for the rollout in phase one. Um, so we're slightly further ahead in Berkshire West than we are in Berkshire East. And then following that trailblazer phase, allocation of funding for subsequent rollout is at regional level. 
Um, and then at local level, once we've kind of been allocated funding, there is a process for making decisions about which local authority schools get, get on, are allocated the next MHST. Um, and that's based on um, a number of factors that are, 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 that are um, indicative of need um, and prioritisation. And so that's part of the reason why, for example, we have two teams in Slough and only one in RBWM and Bracknell, because our indicators of need in Slough are higher. So that was a higher priority area for us to get started with. Um, but we also need the schools to really want to be part of this programme because they do actually have to, to work. They have to identify a, um, a lead for children, young people's emotional well-being and mental health. Um, and certainly in the early phases, um, it, it took a little bit of kind of work to get schools on board with this programme. Um, obviously, they're now starting to see the benefits of it. So it's not quite so much of an issue. Um, they're really small teams, given that they are covering a, a cohort of 8,000 children who could be across a range of different ages because this covers all schools. Um, all, uh, so from kind of, you know, infant schools all the way up to actually um, the early college years. Um, so each team has four education mental health practitioners. That's a new role. Um, that's the training for that. That role has been commissioned through NHSE and Health Education England, um, and they commission the training per MHST. So we've only really got enough um, EMHPs trained nationally to meet the needs of the number of MHSTs that have been commissioned. Um, um, then we have cl some clinical supervision, some senior clinical time, a team lead and some administrative support. Um, in Berkshire East, because we lead those services, those the team leads and the, the clinicians are all CAMS trained and qualified staff. In Berkshire West, we have educational psychologists as the team leads and then we provide some of the clinical input. Um, we involve the, the educational psychologists in the development of the team and the management and running of the team in Berkshire East. So again, very slightly different models. Um, in CAMS, we work to something called the Thrive model. Um, so rather than talking about the way that care is delivered on the basis of kind of universal, um, uh, universal targeted specialist and highly specialist services, which is the sort of usual health pyramid um, in, in children and young people's emotional wellbeing and mental health, we talk about things in terms of thriving. Um, so we have sort of five five areas of thriving. Um, we have the kind of getting advice quadrant, the getting help quadrant, getting more help, getting risk support, all of which contribute to a young person thriving. The MHSTs work um, in the kind of getting advice and getting help um, quadrants. So their role is very much around kind of signposting, self-management, kind of one-off contact, um, and then sort of goals focused, evidence informed, fairly short term focused interventions. Um, so young people with more complex needs would come up to more specialist services. Um, so this just gives you a summary of the types of presentations that they work with. Um, so they will work with young people with low mood um, and depression, panic, generalised anxiety disorders, some kind of fairly straightforward phobias, stress, behavioural difficulties, school avoidance. Um, they can work with some more kind of complex disorders, things like um, where, self, where there is some self-harm going on. Um, and some kind of compulsive behaviours and kind of anger difficulties, but they don't work with things like trauma, bipolar, psychosis, personality disorders, eating disorders, the more kind of chronic difficulties because they need more specialist and longer term interventions. I can see that there's a question, Brian. Uh, yes, yeah, just a quick one on the uh, uh, should not do. To what extent do you have to do something to hold the fort before the young person moves on to that more specialist uh, service pro pro provision? So what we're, what we're aiming towards is a stepped care model, Brian. So what we'd really like is to get to a position where, you know, we're, we're better than we currently are at identifying difficulties in young people at an early stage and we can put that early support in. Um, so we start. So, so what we would hope with the school's model is that we'd start to develop and um, start to identify where a young person might be developing eating difficulties. 
and put in help at an earlier level. Um, so they so that that's the that's the aim um, and they do do some kind of holding work but generally if they've got these types of difficulties um, extreme difficulties then they do need to come up to specialist cams and we actually do a lot of work in specialist cams to to provide support for children and young people while they might wait for a specialist intervention it's probably better at our level because often they're presenting with risk and self-harm by that point great thank you um, how do they work? Well, they, they work in, in quite a, a kind of wide ranging way. Um, so they do provide one to one support. Um, so if a young person is over the age of 12, we tend to work with the individual young person and we may also work with the family. But at the, the school's level, it's it's generally kind of fairly short term interventions. Um, if a young person is under the age of 12, a lot of the way that we work is is with and through the parents. Um, because actually a lot of what needs to be done is actually through the parents and through family based interventions um, and school based changes. Um, we will run group sessions in schools. We um, work with young with young health champions to develop models around peer support and peer mentoring. Um, we work very much within the whole school approach. So we will do whole school assemblies. We um, the the teams do a lot of work in terms of supporting and training staff. We have a webinar program in, in Berkshire East, for example, um, that was really, really, really well um, developed during the pandemic because that was really the only way that we could support schools. Um, but that's that's very well attended and very well um, evaluated. We do workshops um, for staff. We have a training program that we run in Berkshire Healthcare called Psychological um, Perspectives in Education and Primary Care. And we have about 13 different modules of training that we deliver across schools, but also primary care, social care, etc. Um, we run surgeries within schools. We work with individual schools on a termly basis. Um, to identify what are the challenges and difficulties that are going on within the school and to think about what that means in terms of training, what that means in terms of um, kind of whole school policy, whole school approach, um, that kind of that kind of thing. So it's quite a holistic model, really. Rather, It's not just about providing um, interventions to children and young people. It's much more preventative. We also work in partnership with a wide range of people who work in schools, and I think that was a specific question. Um, so we work in like in Berkshire West, the, it's educational psychology who leads the service, but in Berkshire East, they're very much part of our integrated pathway, as are the school nurses and the integrated therapists. So we have um, speech and language therapists, occupational therapists going into most schools, and they work in a very similar way. Um, and there's overlap between some of what we do. So where a young person might be struggling with sensory difficulties um, or where we might be wanting to think collaboratively together with the school around how they support young people who um, maybe um, have neurodiversity issues. Um, and that overlaps between the integrated therapies, the school nursing service and CAMS. And so we work together. Um, I've mentioned the Young Health Champions. That's a programme that runs in Berkshire East. Um, that is that is is supported by XRF, which is a VCS organisation that we have a partnership with, um, and we've worked really closely with the Young Health Champions, who are people who are supported with training to provide peer mentoring. Um, we work with Public Health. We work with the Charlie Wallet Institute, um, who do a huge amount of work within schools um, locally, and we have some staff who are employed across the two. Tooth provide online counselling services um, and they go in and do a lot of work in schools. Um, no, many of our schools have their own either youth counsellors or they buy in youth counselling from the VCS providers within, within each of the six localities. And again, they're part of that integrated approach. Um, and then in Berkshire East and Berkshire West, we have different providers of support for children and young people with neurodiversity. So in Berkshire East, it's GEMS. In Berkshire West, it's a partnership between um, Autism Berkshire and Parenting Special Children. Um, and we also work with organisations like MIND um, and we've brought in organisations like BEAT, for, ex for example, who are the eating disorders charity to do some work in schools around um, helping them to um, understand and to um, identify young people presenting with eating difficulties early on. Um, 
On the final slide, there is a, a link to a YouTube video, which is a video that we, we is one of two videos that we have around the MHST programme in Berkshire East. Um, it's a few minutes long and probably not good use of your time to show it today, but it's well worth the watch. It, it's um, a number of our clinicians, but also quite a few young people. Um, it's an animated video, but it's quite a few young people talking about kind of their experiences and how the MHST has really helped them. Um, and we find that's really valuable in, in working with new schools and just kind of helping young people to feel a little bit more comfortable about approaching um, people for support. Louise, thank you very much, Louise. Very interesting. Paul. Um, thanks, Louise. This sounds uh, terrific. I'd just like to get a view about how embedded this service is already or or how or if it's not embedded, are you recruiting or you know, because um, it, so it sounds great and we sort of imagine from listening to you that our local schools are getting this service, but maybe they're not yet. So um, we that it the, the service is well embedded in the schools that that have MHSTs. Um, so as I said, that we've got sort of approximately forty percent of schools in Berkshire East and forty five percent in Berkshire West. Um, because I manage the Berkshire East side, I have the performance data for Berkshire East, whereas Berkshire West I don't have that data. Um, but certainly for Berkshire East. Um, we have really good feedback from the schools, so they, they really value the support. Um, we have lots of recruitment challenges, Paul, um, and CAMS is, a, is an area where there are, there are recruitment challenges across the board. Um, in East Berkshire, we're obviously close to London. You know, we, we, you, you probably fully understand all of the, the, the kind of locality based challenges that that affect us from a recruitment perspective. With the education mental health practitioners particularly, it's a relatively new workforce. There aren't very many of them. Um, and when we lose one, um, there just isn't a big enough pool to recruit from at the moment. So we are having to, to think quite innovatively and creatively. Um, we've actually just commissioned some additional training places from the University of Southampton, we have relationships with the University of Reading and the University of Southampton, but they both deliver this training program um, because there just aren't enough um, education, trained education mental health practitioners out there. Um, and there is no career pathway for them as yet either. So that's something that NHS England and Health Education England are fully aware of and working on at national level. Um, but it's quite difficult to retain people when there's no you, you can't come in at a particular band and, and they train at band four um, and then are employed at band five once they finish their training so so we are delivering the service we work collaboratively across um, the four MHSTs that we have so we've got a number of vacancies at the moment and most of them happen to, to sit in one locality but we work across so we ensure that we don't have one MHST that is disproportionately um, affected. Okay. Thanks, so. That's good. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, we've, got, we've got four questions now, so we need to sort of Tom Speak Lake. Up, I, well, I don't know. Just to, I want to make sure everyone has their chance. Tom Lake, uh, just wanted to ask if this um, uh, service is being so evaluated, and or if there was evaluations it from the trailblazers and so on. Whether there is continuing evaluation and. Uh, whether we can evaluate service like this? Yeah, there is a national evaluation programme. Um, the the, the model has been built on staff um, it, using things called routine outcome measures um, and a bit like that, the IAPT talking therapy service. There's really good routine outcome measure data from this cohort. Um, and obviously longer term, what we're looking at is to see whether or not it does have the effect of reducing the numbers. The, the pandemic's obviously put a bit of a big spanner in the works on that, um, but but there is a an evaluation process in place. Thank you, Roz. Thanks, Louise. Um, 
It's interesting to hear about the two different models in the West and the East of Berkshire. Um, and it, this question sort of links with what Te Tom has asked about with the evaluation. Um, does the West model provide more challenges in terms of integration with other Berkshire Healthcare Trust services? Um, and is there any early data that shows whether one model works better than the other? Because just having two different models for the sake of difference doesn't seem to be a good reason. And I wonder, you know, what the best model might be going forwards. Yeah, um, there isn't there isn't data. It, it does provide us with more challenges. It's more difficult to to have an integrated service and to deliver a whole pathway. Um, one of the things we're looking at is actually, is there any difference in terms of the number of young people who escalate, whose needs escalate up? that we have a new commissioner in Berkshire West um, and she has been undertaking a review of the MHSTs um, because there is a suggestion that they are, they've moved away from the national model, which is around delivery of evidence-based interventions. Um, so that it, that's for the commissioners of the service to evaluate. Um, but that's that, that's ongoing at the moment. Um, I mean, the other thing that's different about the Berkshire West model, which again is something the CCG, the, the ICB are picking up, is that they don't run, they, they run a term time only service. Um, and there are some challenges because the educational psychology service is a traded service. And so there's some conflict of interest there because this is not a traded service and should be available across the board. Um, you know, so there are some, yeah, there are some intricacies around the way that it's set up in the West that Lila Johansson is looking at at the moment. OK, thanks. Thank you for that. Uh, John, uh, Wellham and then uh, Arlene. Very quickly relating to the two training courses at Southampton and Reading, what are yeah. the prerequisites to go on the course and can they fill the course? Um, they can fill the course. Yeah, these are these are sort of highly sought um, places, and I'm I, I, and I I don't think there would be a problem if NHS England were able to fund more um, both training places and clinical placements. Um, I, I don't have the prerequisite de information to hand. They are they are um, kind of degree level courses, so you have there are academic expectations um, and also. Um, Kind of um, values based expectations really so you don't have to have clinical training they tend to be we tend to have a lot of people that are coming through the route of having been TAs in schools or having been working in, in voluntary sector counselling services or having things like psychology degrees um, and not necessarily thinking they want to go down in a clinical psychology route but but kind of more interested in working in a school setting. Thank you. Thank you John I'm Arlene and then we'll move on. Hi. Yeah, thank you so much for this uh, presentation. Uh, I actually think one of my students has just been appointed to one of these. Um, I'm a professor of psychology at the university. Um, I wanted to ask a, a question. I noticed on one of your slides, you mentioned uh, young carers as one of the criteria for the sort of the locality um, hubs or whatever. And I just wonder if you could say a bit more about what you're, you know, doing with young carers. Um, I think I think Ali, what you were referring to was the indicators that we okay. used to determine whether or not um, mm -hmm. a locality was allocated an MHST on the basis of funding. Um, so looking, so there's a number of indicators, and and the numbers of young carers within a locality is one of the indicators. Um, so the MHSTs um, are not doing anything okay. specifically targeted to young carers. We we are um, as in we within BHFT we don't currently have a, a dedicated service for children who are looked after um, and as part of the work we're doing around children developing that service we're looking at care leavers and also young carers um, and there, there is a piece of work going on around both of those things specifically in the work stream around the 16 to 25 cohort as well um, so there, that, that within the 16 to 25 cohort work, we're thinking where are the areas where there are where there are the kind of quickest wins and the most benefit to be gained, and and the young carers piece fits within that. Uh, okay, because I I only asked because I was just involved in evaluating a 
a not new intervention for young for for young carers with people who have young onset dementia okay. and they seem to fit outside the normal young carers uh provision anyway so they're very unique group but with incredibly complex needs so maybe i i could follow up with you after this meeting yeah yeah yeah. that would be useful because i can take it into the um into the relevant work streams that would be helpful thank you thanks thank you louise thank you very much you can tell this is a topic of considerable interest to the governors uh, indeed to all of us uh, so thank you very much and thanks for your good work and i'm afraid we now have to move on no problem. I'll leave you to it. Thanks very much. No, thank you. Bye. Uh, if you can move on to item six, external auditors report to the Council of Governors. I'm not sure if Ernst and Young are here or Paul, are you going to speak to this or? Oh, no, Maria is here, Martin. Oh, Maria, sorry, forgive me. Oh, Maria, hello, yeah. welcome, sorry. Hi, <laughs> not a problem you. at all, thank you. Um, so since the last um, discussion we had, um, the um, the trust went back and got additional um, valuations completed by Carter Jonas on the um, on the valuation of property. You'll remember um, that we had an issue in that the valuations completed by DVS were um, well out of the range um, of um, our valuers um, kind of um, considerations. And actually, uh, whilst you know, I have some sympathy with two different experts will come up with two different numbers. Our valuers do use quite a wide range in order to um, take account of differences in valuation assumptions and methods. Um, in addition, when we continued to push back to DVS, um, we weren't able to get supporting um, information to the base of some of the assumptions for the valuation. So, um, uh, Carter Jonas completed their valuations. They um, they were able to support their assumptions and the inputs to their valuations, and also their valuations came literally bang in our range um, of expected valuation. So as a result of that, um, both teams have been working incredibly hard to get the amendments agreed for the financial statements. Um, the amendments are within the current year, but also um, prior period adjustments, because obviously um, those valuation methods had been used in prior period as well. Um, we've just got to the point where we've put all the amendments required through the financial statements. Um, when I say we, the two teams are working incredibly hard together, but you'll, you'll understand that's your team have put those adjustments through and our team have audited them. We remain, uh, we remain independent, um, but we've got the amendments through the financial statements. Um, we identified just a couple of um, further tweaks needed in those amendments where the odd little slip had been made. So they've, they're back now. Um, with the finance team are happy with them. They just want to do one final check through, which is incredibly sensible given the pressure that we've all been under to turn this round. It's good that they're taking time to do that. Um, and then we will have the final statements. We're pushing for signing by the end of this week. Um, uh, it's been incredibly fast paced. So we're just now making sure that all those final checks are done to make sure that what we do sign is is absolutely solid and, and as expected. Um, there are just a couple of things we still need to see. So I still need to see the annual report. So that should come through to me, hopefully today, if not tomorrow morning. And I've got resources ready to tick through and check that. And at that point, we will issue, once I'm happy with that, we will be issuing our opinion. Um, we will ask um, uh, for a letter of representation from the trust, which is basically a representation that you've you've given us everything we've asked for and there's nothing that you need to tell us that you haven't told us um and we will um obviously then ask for um ask for the signed um the signed various bits and documents from yourself so that we can then so that then i can sign um so i'm still pushing for all of that to happen by close of play on friday um, I'm not sure whether Paul wants to add anything to that. Thank you, Maria. I'm just going to ask Paul if he wishes to comment. OK, sorry. It's all right. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I think just um, I share Maria's comments. It's been a, a long journey trying to get the accounts finalised this year. Um, and it is difficult when you've got um, different, different, differing professional judgments effectively. 
um, it's good that we've got where we've got to. I think, Maria, can you just confirm based on everything you've seen, it, it, it'll be an unqualified opinion, won't it? Yeah, absolutely. Just, just so that I'm like say, just probably putting that into um, public at the AJM this afternoon. Yes. Um, so, like I say, we're in conversations with Chair of Audit Committee. So once we get the RIS reports finalised, we should be able to sign off relatively quickly. Okay, any, any questions from governors? No, I think we've stunned everyone to silence, but Maria, <laughs> thank you and, and to Paul and teams for, for all you've done. This is, uh, um, I'm sure we'd rather not have done this, but anyway, it's, uh, it's Paul says it's a, it's not a sort of a fault, it's a, it's a difference of opinion on professionals. So but anyway, it seems we've got closure right now. So thank you everyone for that. Um, so I think we finished um, on the, the audit side. Thank you very much. Um, now we can move on then to item seven, the trust annual report and accounts. And I think Julian have got down as a presentation. Is that right? Thanks, Martin. Yeah, brief presentation from myself and uh, and Paul. Um, and it's the same presentation for those who are at the AGM. So it's uh, it's the kind of statutory required sort of presentation. I, I, I do try to sort of bring things uh, to, to life. So for those people who are new or uh, welcome, I'm Julian, Julian Ems, I'm the Chief Executive. And what I'm going to do is give you a flavour of the, uh, the last financial year. So it's a look back, which is a requirement at the AGM and as part of our presentation of our tr trust annual report. Um, it is inevitably a very truncated version and I've missed a lot of things out. If you really want to know what the trust did last year, then the annual report is, 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 is very, very detailed. And the other source of information, probably the best source of information I often go to, is our quality accounts, again, for the previous year. There's, there's so much material there. This is a superficial, high-level sort of look and giving you a flavour of things over the last year. So if, Linda, we can have the, 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 the presentation sort of put up. I think I've got about eight or so slides, and I'll, I'll tick through it reasonably uh, quickly, Martin. Thank you. Um, We've got uh, 10 minutes, I think. OK, um, next slide, please. So that's Paul's by the looks of it, is it? There we go. Ah, that's something else. That's a quarter one, I think. <laughs> Doesn't look like you've got it, does it? No, that's not it. Never mind. I'm, I'm in the interest of time. Um, Paul, do you want to do the finances first? Do your ones first, and I will send through to Linda the presentation I've got. That's going to be the best way of managing time, I think. So you put Paul's up. We'll do his first. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. So thanks, Julie. So um, for those that don't know me, I'm Paul Brown, the uh, Chief Financial Officer, um, Berkshire Healthcare. Um, so if we just move on to the first slide. Thanks, Julie. So first, I think just start by setting some context for the 21-22 financial year. So as in the prior year, the financial regime under which the trust operated and in which the NHS operated was heavily adapted in terms of um, needing to respond to the, the COVID pandemic. So we received financial support for our COVID response. The key difference in 21-22 was that instead of our costs um, just being covered as they were incurred, um, Bob, which is Berkshire, Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire ICS, um, was given a, a, a single um, COVID support allocation, which was then um, allocated down to individual organisations with an expectation that we would manage our costs within that. So we were still funded, um, albeit with a, a level of control over that funding. We continued to get support from the centre in terms of PPE, both in terms of supply and funding for purchase. And it was a complex and challenging year in the sense that the financial year was split in two in terms of doing a, a plan for the first six months of the year and then having to do a plan for the second six months of the year as well. But overall, we set a plan for break even across the year 
and that break-even plan contributed towards Bob ICS's overall financial target for the year, which again was was a break-even. Um, obviously, given we were responding heavily to the pandemic um, and given the, the financial regime, we didn't set the organisation an efficiency programme or a cost improvement programme in 21-22 as we would have done in prior years. Um, and in terms of uh, capital expenditure, um, the, the process now is that um, ICSs are given a, a limit in terms of the amount of capital expenditure that organisations can, can spend. So this isn't funding, this is expenditure from our, our own cash reserves. So we have to agree as a, as a collective within the ICS, all of the providers, how much capital we can spend each year. And for 21-22, we agreed that our capital spend limits would be 7.9 million. So Julie, next slide, please. Thank you. So if we move on to 21-22 and our actual financial results for the year, as you can see from the table, um, we reported a surplus in 21-22 of 1.6 million. Uh, included within that 1.6 million is a 1.4 profit on disposal of a property that we had in uh, Reading. Um, so if you exclude that 1.4, we finished with a £200,000 surplus and it's that £200,000 surplus that would count towards our ICS control target. So effectively, we finished the year better than, than what we planned, which is, which is hugely positive. You'll also see from the table, if you look at the top line in terms of total income, um, we brought in uh, close to 19 million of income last year over and above what we brought in the prior year. So pushing 6% uh, income growth. And just to, just to break that down for you to give a little bit more detail. So that would cover items like national annual inflation funding that we get to cover rising salary costs and rising non-pay costs. We've got continued mental health investment standard coming through from our commissioners, which is effectively an enhanced level of growth, recognising uh, years of underfunding into mental health services. And we also received in total around 9 million of what was badged as spending review and service development funding. And these, these were allocations from our commissioners targeted very much on community and mental health services, including a number of schemes, um, including uh, Aging Well, which is uh, our enhanced community um, response and service. So again, that was um, significant new investment coming into the organisation and helped in part in terms of how we were able to respond to the pandemic. We also had additional income in respect of uh, specific services. So certainly um, ASD and ADHD, dental and in-services also received quite significant levels of new investment over the course of the year. Um, and as you'll see, that 6% increase in our uh, income position was offset by a 6% increase in our expenditure position with the majority of the costs rising in line with the investments that um, that we enacted during during the year. In terms of capital investment, you'll see there that we spent 7.2 million, which given everything that was happening in terms of um, national supply chains and COVID is a remarkable effort by the teams. So 4.2 million of continued investment in IMT infrastructure and equipment, um, which obviously during COVID and with advent of home working has been absolutely essential to maintain operations of the organisation. And we spent 3 million improving and developing our estate, um, most notably of which was 800,000 into Phoenix House in Wokingham, which is where we where we look after some of our um, pooliest um, young children. So uh, if you take financial performance into account, some movements in our, our working capital position and some investment income that we received that we've deferred with a plan to spend in the next financial year, that effectively accumulated in our cash position increasing by 15 million. So we finished the year with a very healthy cash reserve of uh, 53.9 million. 
um, and obviously, uh, although although yet to sign, um, we have got indications from our external audit partners that we've got an unqualified audit opinion, um, which is obviously where we aim on an annual basis. Julie, just final slide. So just looking forward into 22-23, um, as we move out of COVID from a from a planning perspective, it, we're moving very much towards kind of business as usual and where we were in terms of how we operated um, pre-pandemic in terms of financial regimes. We're still receiving um, an element of support for COVID costs and some COVID funding, although this has been reduced by probably close to 50%. And we're still at this point receiving, like I said, continued support in terms of PPE costs and such like. Um, we go into the year facing much greater inflationary pressures than we've seen previously. Um, and although uh, the centre has provided some additional funding to ease that, um, obviously with utilities, et cetera, uh, we're still we're still looking to bear higher inflation costs than what we would have expected normally. Um, and if you take take all of that into account, we've set a plan for 22-23 of a £900,000 deficit um, embedded within that, as you would expect, is a return to efficiency programmes and cost improvements. And we've set the organisation a 3% efficiency target for this year which is which is close to to 10 million in terms of capital investment um, we've agreed a 11 million pound allocation from the system and that's going to be focused on some key investments including um, reprovision of our hq in bracknell um, some new clinical accommodation in newbury and replacement of some um, clinical accommodation um, in windsor as well as a new place of safety facility at Prospect Park in Reading. So some quite meaty investments across the estate over this coming year. Uh, taking i e performance, capital expenditure into account, we're expecting our cash position to drop by about 7 million over the course of the year. Um, but I think even, even with that, that will still leave us with a pretty strong position in terms of our cash reserves. So happy to take any questions. Any quick questions for Paul? No. Thank you very much, Paul. Good, uh, good, sorry. Oh, Tom. Uh, thank you. Um, just to just to ask about the general level of capital. If I go to the RBH AGM, I expect to see a capital expenditure of somewhere about forty millions or something. Now it's an acute hospital and uh, you know, trust. I know it's very different, but I wonder um, is the approach to capital. Um, really the right thing i mean have we got the right the right balance really or are is it just is there a sort of prejudice or sort of perhaps conventional thinking that mental health trusts and community trusts don't need that much capital so i think it's a, it's a really good question i mean from the outset my start point would be that the capital allocations that are provided nationally are probably wholly insufficient for um for the level of ambition of the organisations. I mean, for 22, 23, um, excluding targeted allocations, Bob as a whole has about 100 million pounds worth of capital to spread across, um, you know, Oxford University hospitals, Oxford Health, us, books, um, RBH. So e even just taking into account some of the critical conditions in terms of infrastructure and buildings, that's not a lot to spread across those organisations. I think, I would expect that acutes would always have a higher proportion of the capital expenditure. Simply, as you said, they they have significantly bigger owned estate, which they're responsible for, as well as uh, much higher levels of, of equipment and, you know, big levels of kit, including scanners and things like that. I think the thing to bear in mind is obviously we have two PFIs, so therefore we, we've got smaller estate and some of our estate is in much better condition which means we don't have to spend the level of expenditure that some of the others do. OK, thank you. Thank you, Tom. I think we better move on to Julian. So we have an AGM coming up later. <laughs> Julian. And have you got my presentation now to put up? I sent it through. Great stuff. Thanks very much. Okay. 
The, uh, the first slide, please, is just a reminder for those people. It's really for people coming to the AGM. Uh, pretty much every year I get asked questions about the Royal Berkshire or Frimley Park, Heatherwood. So the first slide is just to remind people because it is complicated who we are and, and what we do. If we move to the next slide, just to say that although we haven't had a, uh, a formal uh, large inspection, the CQC have been into our services since we were last inspected. They've been at Prospect Park, they've visited uh, and they've done a number of desktop things. They are at the moment visiting on a risk basis only and at the moment uh, are content with where we are. So our rating remains uh, as outstanding, which we're obviously really pleased with. Next slide, please. So uh, Paul referenced a couple of things we did uh, in the annual report itself. It talks about a whole list of pages and pages of service developments. I've just picked out two here. We established the Phoenix unit, which is a child and adolescent mental health day service, uh, as well as an outreach service for some of the um, uh, uh, riskiest, poorliest ch children with uh, mental health conditions. As a consequence of opening that, we've significantly been able to reduce the number of young children who need admission to a hospital bed. It's been very successful and as a model, it's getting picked up nationally and probably going to be rolled out a bit more. Uh, and the, uh, the, 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 it's involved both establishing the team, but also, as Paul mentioned, doing some work uh, within the building itself. And we also opened the new campion unit, which is our assessment and treatment unit for people with learning disability. So a bespoke unit, it probably doesn't do it quite justice, the pictures there, but it is a much better unit than we previously had. And it was no mean feat getting all the specialist materials. It's been much more difficult with inflationary costs and also Brexit, actually getting the stuff together and opening it was a, was a really uh, pleasing time for us. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things that you'll have heard the uh, Secretary of State talk about is her priorities ABC uh, and the, the B is backlog. We have seen some really big increases in demand combined in some instances with real significant workforce shortages. So over the last year we've developed very long waits in services that sometimes already had long waits. So children's neurodiversity, ASD, ADHD, our community speech and language therapy and podiatry to name but uh, a few. Some of those are like neurodiversity are a combination of huge increase in referrals and uh, some workforce shortages which have been attended to actually because we've had investment. Others are around uh, workforce shortages or indeed perhaps um, uh, service models that need changing. Um, so there is this pent up demand. Some of the services were closed uh, or, or only had limited opening during the kind of lockdown phase. So obviously built up a, a backlog as well. And um, one in 10 NHS posts is now currently vacant. Uh, but if we open our eyes a bit more widely, there's a million more people who are economically inactive than there were uh, pre-pandemic. And that's mainly older people who've chosen to, to withdraw from work altogether. And we employ many people. And so the, 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 the workforce challenges are probably our biggest existential challenge that we faced last year and future years. Despite that, if you look at the next slide, there are um, half a dozen services um, that have a national requirement in terms of waiting times, and we hit all of those. So I'm not going to talk through those for the uh, interest of time today, although I will at the AGM, but all national targets we've hit. In some cases, just, it's been quite hard. Uh, in some cases, you'll see that in terms of the audiology diagnostics in the last quarter's report and the later report today. But so far, so good. I think uh, in terms of uh, th thinking about patients still, the next slide looks at patient experience. and. Uh, uh, last year we launched our I Want Great Care patient experience measure. I'm not going to say too much about it to this uh, group because we've actually got the patient experience report, Martin, so I'm going to pass over that because we'll cover quite a lot of its content uh, when Liz talks to that report, if that's OK. But I would say that was a very significant development for us. The next slide um, is that despite all of those pressures, uh, we came top in the staff survey in terms of staff engagement. You know. Uh, motivation, satisfaction, recommending as a place to work, which we're really delighted at, uh, and some of the very best top scores. And of course, there's always room for improvement, but our engagement score you know, compares with the very best in other industries too. So we should be rightly proud that we've managed to maintain that level of staff satisfaction against one of the most challenging backdrops that we've ever operated in. However, um, we have got some challenges, uh, as the next slide alludes to. So colleagues who with a declared disability or from a black, Asian, minority ethnic background do not feel as positive about the trust. And that has been a major focus of work for us. Uh, and, you know, we've we've done uh, a number of things 
such as overhauling our recruitment processes or our disciplinary processes to make sure they're just and fair. Uh, and that appears to be making a difference, although progress is slow. But we have done some really good things. Uh, we had excellent Pride Month. Uh, the trust was fantastically represented at Reading Pride uh, uh, recently and in the previous years. We've got a new uh, network as well, uh, our Courage Network, which are for our veterans. And we've been all, uh, awarded the Gold Award uh, by the Ministry of Defence as a, a recognition of our veterans friendly policies and approaches. So some really good stuff as well in the in the context of some challenges around some elements of our workforce. Next slide, please. Uh, we also established comprehensively our wellbeing services. Uh, it's a range of support. It's got a helpline, but it ranges right through to one to one, especially support with psychologists or team support with a group of psychologists. And the important thing about this is that this wellbeing offer is offered to all local authorities in Berkshire. So we offer it out, not just to ourselves, but all local authorities and the acute trust too. And we support uh, 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 the wider community when there are some big significant incidents. For example, we did that with the Forbury Gardens attack. We did that with the fire in Reading, um, where a number of people were tragically killed. So our wellbeing service is not just for Berkshire Healthcare, it's actually part of the wider community, has been hugely successful and provides evidence-based psychological support. And then my final slide is just to remind everybody, um, we're in two integrated care systems. It's the new way the NHS organise ourselves. Um, uh, Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire and Berkshire West uh, covers the west of Berkshire and Frimley is predominantly East Berkshire with a bit of Hampshire and Surrey. Um, and the intention is, is collaboration, not competition, and to really uh, concentrate long term on the health and well-being of the populations. And in relation to that system working in the last year, we've established virtual wards for physical health care. Uh, instead of actually having more hospital beds, which have been very successful, and rapid community response teams, which go into people's homes, effectively doing a lot of the work that perhaps GPs would have done many years ago in terms of home visits very quickly and preventing admission to A&E. We've been doing a lot of work, which I lead across the ICS, is on reducing agency spend by aligning organisations in terms of what they're paying and who they're using. And uh, probably the best example is our shared care record called Connected Care, uh, where we can see uh, and we certainly share most information in terms of our clinical record to primary care, social care and our acute partners. It's also used as a platform to target particular elements of the population so we can target things where we think there's high incidence of diabetes, for example. So there are some of the examples that you can do in terms of integrated care. It is still quite early days and uh, I, uh, my aspiration, and I know Martin's, is that over the coming years we can perhaps show some more larger, newer examples of the benefits of uh, working together. But as I was saying, a committed, a committed member of those two partnerships. Whistle stop tour, Martin. Um, you know, as I say, you can't really do justice to the whole year, but at least it gives a flavour. Julian, thank you. Well, at the AGM, the probably a bit, bit more time, but it's been, I think, a very sound, a very an excellent year in spite of all the challenges. Uh, uh, and some of these things to do with systems working, you know, things are happening, but we need to learn more. And if you look forward five or 10 years, one would expect to see much more uh, joint working between all the partners. Um, and that's the sort of direction of travel. But Julian and Paul, thank you very much. Very clear. Um, if we could move on to item eight, which is committee and steering groups. Um, we've only got a few minutes for this. I don't know whether we just want to take questions or whether the chairs of each one just want to say something. Quick, how would you like to do it? Tom, let's ask well, you just, first. Yes, just say that um, we've been in discussions with uh, Paul Myersko and Martin about the Living Life to the Full group. This was a group that um, uh, John Barrett really uh, gave a lot of effort, a lot of energy to, and was very, it was a very interesting group, but there wasn't any succession planning. And uh, now we're trying to uh, uh, reformulate it a little bit to take part of the to take into account the fact that there are new partnerships because the focus we're trying to get is on the patient's journey, the pathway. Part of it might be in the trust, but part of it might be elsewhere. So working with the perhaps charitable organisations or local authority um, outside the trust for, for patients and working with other, uh, uh, perhaps a bit of a look, uh, a bit more than council can give uh, at some of the partnership working where the patient moves between uh, organizations so that's what we're trying to do I, if we I, I won't be in the 
a governor for long, but we've got a chance to get it going. And I hope um, I found this that committee particularly useful and learned a great deal. Um, I hope others will want to get in. We've got a great speaker on the 12th of October uh, talking about the um, uh, the I think the Bracknell uh, Recovery College. So recovery colleges are a big example of uh, an important organisation that uh, uh, patients go on, come, move through, and uh, so that that's really important. And then we'll perhaps discuss where we want to go. We have some time to discuss where to go. So we're meeting on the 12th of October, and I hope you'll join me in shaping this new group and uh, really understanding how patients move from the trust and how they how they then move with other other organisations and how that all works and well, how the trust can do that as well as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Look forward to uh, governors taking an interest in that, I think. Um, any other of the chairs wish to speak? I'm, Brian? Um, yes, just a quick point. I think uh, an increasing theme of, uh, of the work of uh, membership and public engagement uh, needs to be address the uh, timed out departure of highly experienced governors. We don't just face a reducing number of governors potentially, but also a loss of experience and talent. And I think that challenge is uh, is ever growing and we're uh, we're now going to have to face that with some, uh, uh, well, material effort, shall I say. Yeah, I, I, I think, Brian, that uh, I think we're all very keen to increase the diversity as well, which isn't just about uh, ethnicity or whatever, it's also about age. Uh, you know the the stage in one's life that one is. So I think we we need to focus on that quite hard. I think. Thank you for your support, Paul. Hi. Yes, I'd I'd like to say a couple of words about well three things about the quality group. Um, first of all, last time we met in person, and um, I have to report that six of us were in the room and we resisted the very strong urge to hug and kiss, but we did have a great time and we felt. <laughs> a little inkling of the joy that used to accompany this role as uh, as governor, but has been absent since we've been online. Um, it was also we also had six members come online and it was satisfactory for them, I, I believe, from our little survey, but we can make it better. So next time the QA group will be a hybrid meeting, even better for people coming in online. But I can advise those people that are tempted to come in person and experience the joy. Um, second, read the report. If you don't know about the QAG, it's got everything you need to know about the group. Um, the third thing I want to say is about service visits. Um, governors, of course, should attend council meetings, and there are probably 35 or more meetings arranged for governors who are really diligent, but probably after council meetings, the most important thing a governor can do is visit a service in person and actually see our wonderful staff and feel the joy coming from those staff that they get from their jobs. And also talk to patients. And um, I'm going to extend the offer, which I've given for a long time to the QA group, that if a governor wants to visit a service, and they're a bit shy or they haven't done it before and they need to know how to go about it to contact me and I will support them. So there's a big list which has been sent out. Find a service that you're interested in, then email me and I'll arrange a joint visit. I think it's better if two governors go together, although it's no longer a requirement. So bear that in mind. My email address, everyone has it, I think. So you contact me if you want to do that and want some support. Thanks, Martin. No, thank you, Paul. And just on your visits, I mean, I think the staff really value the visits as well as you know the governors valuing what they, they learn about the trust. So I, I would support your plea for more visits. Mark? Yeah, just a very quick point, Martin. Um, picking up your point there, Paul, that some governors may, as it's their first visit, or be reluctant to go out on their own. We as non-executives also do service visits, and we'd be more than happy to accompany and have a governor join us on our own visits. And so if we could coordinate that through uh, the executive team um, and the secretarial team, we'd be more than happy. And we've got dates in our own diaries that you could join us and we could do dual visits. Thank you. Thank That's you, Mark. Great. Share that. Thank you very much, everyone. Then I think we'd better press on. Now, item nine is executive reports. The first one is the patient experience quarter one. Unfortunately, I've just been told that Liz Chapman can't be with us. Uh, 
uh, for, uh, for personal reasons. So um, I don't think so there's just, much so pointing. Just, yeah, I mean, I know so, quite a bit about it, Martin. Should oh, Julian, take, if you could, if you could just, just speak. Take, yeah, I mean, the, the, the main thing about this report that's different, Martin, it's the first one where we've been able to use the I want great care feedback. And I think obviously it showcases that. So for those people who don't know, um, and a number of you do, so I do apologise, but there are some new governors. We, 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 in terms of getting regular feedback in a way that was useful for the Organisation for Services and Clinicians, it was pretty clunky. So some services have got their own very bespoke patient experience questions, which they still continue with. We then had the family and friends test, which was just those two very crude questions. Um, and they worked OK in physiotherapy services. They worked less well in the psychiatric intensive care unit. Yeah, would you recommend this as a place to your friends or whatever? It didn't, didn't land so, so well. And then at the other extreme, we had an annual uh, very comprehensive patient survey that only goes to a small segment of our patient population. So the I want great care was designed to address the middle ground, you know, half a dozen sort of questions that have been worked up with actually patients that are consistent across the organisation, although a couple relate to premises, so that's not always relevant as it explained. And what we've got in the patient experience report now is some reasonable numbers of feedback relating to I want great care. And what Debbie and Liz have done, so Debbie, our Director of Nursing, have attempted to triangulate I want great care with issues around complaints, waiting times and things like that. So we're starting to build the picture of where the really good stuff in the organisation is and where the improvement opportunities are. And that's that's really the essence of the report. So again, it will evolve as we get more and better detailed information. But I do think it, it it's less reliant on just the complaints as the previous one was, and it's starting to give a bit richer data. It would be my take on it, Martin. OK, um, thank you for that. I, I think um, we've seen this at the board and uh, I think our feelings this is going to give us a much better view of of the realities of life, uh, of the experience of patients, and feeding, as Julian says, feeding to this continuous improvement cycle. Uh, the friends and family test was pretty, um, pretty thin on real information, I think, on which you could act. So thanks for that. Are there any questions? I know it's a bit difficult with Liz not being here. Any questions for Julian on this item? No? Okay, well, we'll be seeing more of it and you'll, you'll get used to it and hopefully um, you'll find that really helpful. Now, I've got on the agenda, Julian, performance report, but I don't seem to have it in my pack. Am I the only one that's not got it? I've got it. Oh, OK. Um, I had to pass over to, to you then. <laughs> I don't seem to have it in my pack for some reason. OK, now we're just going to whip through this, are we? Yeah. OK. Um, so uh, is it is this just the narrative bit of the report, uh, Linda? Can you just flick through because I'll, I'll just take questions on this because people will have, will have seen this bit. I, I think normally we just take questions on this. Yes. Team. OK, that's that's what we. So the question this is the sort of uh, context update. So I'll just take some uh, sort of questions just to say um, the, the, the first item is out of date in the sense that we've just seen a, a real uh, uptick in COVID cases across our hospitals sort of settings. So uh, mask wearing has been back now for a week or so, and we've got outbreaks in quite a few of our wards. So as the immunity wanes, as the weather changes, et cetera, et cetera, schools back, we have seen an uptake, uptick in sort of COVID uh, with quite a lot of our staff going off sick. And uh, because we relax like the rest of the uh, NHS did mask wearing, we've had to go back on our inpatient units. We're still not, and in fact, you can't get tests for asymptomatic testing off, off the website. But at the moment, that's the only change, Martin, since the, the published papers went out. Happy to take any questions on any of it, including obviously the, the performance bit, which covers quality and safety and workforce metrics and things. Yeah, Paul. Sorry, Julian, I've got a couple of questions. Um, the, the awards, very interesting local award in relation to hope, but it doesn't say anything about um, the impact on patients. In the, I mean, is this a theoretical exercise or is it actually something embedded and used by the trust um, as a new process? 
Yeah, it, it, it's the 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 the, the model is uh, a, a complete redesign end to end from inpatients right through to community support. Um, so it's a collaboration with Oxford Health and uh, colleagues in Gloucester. So it allows us to do things we wouldn't ever be able to do. So no, it's 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 a new model. Um, it's too early to say if it's changed the world, Paul, but it's certainly mm -hmm. made a difference. Uh, both in terms of accessing services, sharing services amongst trusts, um, so being able to move resources around and build up, particularly um, uh, a more resilient workforce by by working across organisational boundaries. So it's okay. it, it's more than perhaps you indicated, but I wouldn't be overclaiming things. So it's nice to get that award. Um, uh, it's probably a recognition of the collaboration as much as anything else. Okay, so it's probably something to look at more in the future when when it's yeah, more embedded. So and this fuller stock take report, which you mentioned um, again, this is well, not again, this is focused on um, primary care, I think. So That's I'm right. just wondering if if you see impacts here in relation to our trust. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it has. We've, we've had a number of uh, papers and things around primary care. Claire Fuller is a, a GP herself. She's the ICS lead in Surrey Heartlands as well. She was asked to do this by NHS England. And yes, I, I think it does have an impact uh, a number of ways, really. Um, there is a, a desire to see uh, more and more of the workforce embedded in, in primary care, which is fine. Um, but the workforce planning around that has got to be careful about how we do that. Um, so, so we have worked with primary care, for example, setting up some of those uh, mental health support teams, which we've had a presentation on, which has been part of that. And the, the, the fuller vision, I guess, is around doing more of that where it's possible. So rather than people going to hospitals and everything else, you know, building that up. Now, there's some practical challenges around that. One of them is the estates and the buildings, Paul, accommodating it. So uh, as primary care is built up, um, its workforce, for example, in the last year or so, um, uh, GPs have served notice on community nurses who are also a very important and, and ask them to move out because so they could accommodate their own sort of growing workforce with physios and everything else. So I definitely think there is some impact. I think there's some challenges and our intention is to try and sort of work through in a more harmonised way with primary care colleagues. So we're not operating in silos and we understand the implications of growing workforce in either way uh, and, and also the, the implications for buildings and estates. OK, because uh, I mean, from a governor point of view, it it sort of implies some sort of competition or, or blurring of boundaries between the the competition for our staff or blurring the boundaries between our operation and the the primary care operators. Um, yes, which... so, so certainly that's that, that, that's definitely the case. I mean, I suppose the other way around looking at it is to reduce the big gap sometimes that can exist between primary care and 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 specialist services where people can fall between it or the transitions a bit ugly. And I think it's around uh, the, the philosophically trying to address that, Paul, which I think is is no bad thing. And then I think you're right. I mean, the intention it should be a collaborative one in the system. But if you get it wrong, I think I think you're picking up on a point. You, you could end up potentially in competition around the workforce. So, so I, I I think you're right. It's about how you manage it. I think. Okay. Thank you, Thanks. Ross. And then we better move on. Thanks. Um, given that you've already mentioned, Julian, that one of the most significant challenges for the trust is workforce. I noted in the workforce metrics that the target for recruitment is 55 days, but it's still actually taking 97 days to get people in place. Presumably that's being um, prioritised as, as an area that really needs to improve because presumably we might be losing people to other organisations simply because the process takes too long. Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, our process was um, uh, I couldn't cope with the demand, couldn't cope with the level of vacancies. So we have introduced uh, automatization. Automiz so we've got a bot that deals with quite a lot of the, 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 the recruitment processes now, which is quite helpful. But part of the 97 days is from the point the job is advertised to the point a vacancy is filled. So partly it's about process, but partly it's about people being on often in the NHS two months notice, 60 days uh -huh. before they can sort of leave. But, but I wouldn't want that latter point to uh, overshadow the former point which you made um, so we have been quite clear our processes were not, we were missing a trick. Had, had, had The recruitment team was overwhelmed 
uh, with the level of activity uh, and the processes were uh, not optimal. So it's both of those things, actually. And yeah, it's, it's received quite a lot of uh, time and attention, including significant digital investment. So the routine filtering of the thousands of applications for thousands can be automated. And that's that's starting to, to really help process. And then the other thing, in we've brought in our more challenge services. We've actually brought in dedicated fast track support, um, external private providers who often worked in agencies who are just working alongside managers and they were just smashing the process. So in some cases, you know, reducing it to about 14 days end to end, things like that. But that's that's a limited resource targeting the most challenging. We need to get the, the mainstream back up and running. So I, I agree. I think we're agreeing. OK, thanks. Julian, th thanks so much for that. Um, I think because of the time, I think we better move on. And we've got um, Care Strategy presentation from Katie, and I know governors are very interested in this. So, Katie, can I hand over to you, please? Morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, I've got some slides to share, if that's OK. Can you tell me roughly how long? Um, roughly. I can make it 10 minutes, if that's better. <laughs> I think it was down for 15, but I can oh, reduce. Well, that's all right, 10 to 15. That's OK. And then. Um, OK, so hopefully, is that sharing? Can you put it on full screen, you know, the slide? Yeah, I will. So hopefully it will come up now on the full screen. And Thank I can you. all see you all too, so that's good. So if anyone's got any questions throughout, please fire away. OK, so um, just initially, just to clarify what we mean by um, uh, what is a carer. So a carer is anyone, including children and adults, who looks after a family member, partner or friend who needs help because of their illness, frailty, disability, a mental health problem or an addiction, and they can't cope without that support and it's unpaid care. Um, and it's a bit of a recap because we, I recognise some people are new. Um, this is our strategy kind of in a nutshell. Um, we've got services working towards six standards um, of uh, so to support our carer strategy and all of our work streams are, are linked to these and hopefully um, the next few slides will give you a snapshot of some of the things that we've been doing. So um, my role as carer's lead was introduced last May. So a lot of the time um, I've been trying to engage and build relationships both internally and externally. So that's with organisations like NHS England, the Triangle of Care and Carers UK nationally, or with our um, ICS partners. Um, we've recently set up a regional carers lead network. So we've got representation and links in with um, other trusts like Royal Barks, Buckinghamshire, Oxford Health, Southern Health, etc. And obviously across Berkshire, we've got six local authorities so linked in with all of those um, partners um, attend various uh, strategy meetings and forums and links to local voluntary sector partners too so um, really working closely with them making sure that our strategy aligns with theirs um, and keeping engaged so for example uh, Bracknell and Reading have uh, are recently looking to refresh their strategies and I'm working with them on that so I, I wasn't quick enough earlier on to take the name of the person that asked about young carers but if um, if Julie could share my email uh, address with that individual I will follow up with them because that's really key we we are trying to work with organizations like Family Action um, for engaging with young carers but if there is um, specific things that we, we we need to take back to the local authorities I can do that as well so I'd be really interested to to talk to that person in more detail um, so internally we've set up a friends and family carers steering group so we've got representation from across all the divisions and services and we've also got carer and governor representation on that as well um, it reports uh, quarterly um, no sorry six monthly in August and February to the quality and performance executive group and also yearly to the uh, quality assurance committee um, so internally, I've been attending various um, meetings, collaborating on a number of different projects and attending some uh, care events and support groups. And this is some pictures from uh, Maidenhead when they had an event for the, uh, the Jubilee. Um, other projects that we're working on um, are I'll touch upon in, in due course. So when I originally started, we felt it was really important to set out a baseline assessment. So we set out an evaluation form that gathered data on current activities to understand the current state of play. There are 43 responses from the different services, and that really helped us um, inform what we could do going forward. So that meant that um, 
it did take the opportunity to review some of our original intentions. So things like the self-assessment review process, we want to review that and digitalise it, and the idea of a manager's toolkit to help services um, embed some of this to change the culture. So um, what's also been achieved is we reviewed the existing training that was quite ad hoc across different services in relation to care awareness. We've created some online uh, training that's available through our e-learning packages and it's for friends, family and care awareness training. We wanted to um, spread the kind of terminology so that we were clear that actually a, an unpaid carer could be that family friend or, or um yeah, family member or friend. And often people don't identify as such. So we want that to be very clear in kind of the messaging. Um, people often see their caring role as an extension of their relationship with uh, their family member. Um, other things that we've done is update the website, um, added additional pieces of information, sort of frequently asked questions, trying to make things as easy as possible for, for carers when they're accessing at the time that they need um, additional advice. We want to include further updates in that. We've had some feedback about the language and the imagery on the website, so we're looking to update that. We've also updated the uh, intranet, um, and again, you can see there we've tried to include some more uh, visual uh, and imagery in the wording, and hopefully that's where we'll also add the manager's toolkit, so services can have a one-stop shop internally to identify and access some of this information. Clearly, we're really keen on hearing the carer's voice throughout all of this, so um, We've got a 10 minute video available on Nexus for teams to use in learning events or similar sessions so that we can help and support them to understand um, engaging with carers throughout that process. Um, we're looking to record a few more stories and journeys um, in, within different services to give that cross section. Um, We've talked about I want great care um, as the patient experience tool. Uh, the patient experience tool also does allow carers to fill it in on behalf of the patient, but what it doesn't do is gather um, carers direct feedback. So what we've done is set up a different process to gather carer feedback on their experience of our services. Um, I won't click into the form, but uh, the, the link is there if anyone wants it and the link's also on the website. So um, carers can give us their, their direct experience of, of, of the service um, from their perspective. And we've introduced different um, posters and things that services can use to, to access that and did um, QR codes, et cetera. We'll be hopefully reporting on that through Tableau. We we're linking in with the um, BI team at the moment regarding that. Um, at this stage, uh, what we want to do is uh, gather all this data and then potentially once the I want great care tools a bit further embedded is review in six to 12 months, whether there could be an extension um, of to get gather care feedback as part of I want great care. Um, and at the moment, what I also did was when we came up with the questions in this uh, feedback form is they mirror quite um, uh, a lot of the I want great care questions. So the data that we've got will hopefully um, would be easily um, you know, cross-referenced uh, in due course if we did move in that direction. Uh, what we've also managed to do is get some funding for a number of um, uh, projects through NHS England. Um, so the first one related to um, supporting carers, supporting veterans. So we undertook a piece of research um, with qualitative and quantitative data from our carers because we really wanted to hear their experiences. And it wasn't just experiences of our services. We worked in conjunction with the Ripple Pond, um, a, a, a voluntary sector organisation, so that we were gathering whether people were aware of our services and their experience um, as well. So um, what we did was we had some outputs from that, which were going to be on their new um, specific uh, website for the Veterans um, Op Courage Service. Um, and also there's a psycho education uh, video that we've created to support carers to understand some of their carers behaviour, um, sorry, some of their loved ones behaviour. Um, and again, with the discharge to assess, we um, completed a similar exercise with uh, families and carers. Uh, the feedback was that there is or appears to be a direct, pretty much a direct correlation between their view of the communication and engagement they've had and the quality of care that, that that's received. So we've um, got some outputs from that project as well, one of which is um, going to be a video um, explaining the services so that they're setting that expectation at the outset. Um, when someone was talking about the joy earlier of the staff, I've got there's four members of staff in that video and it really comes across um, how how caring and the, the, the professional service that they deliver. So well, I think we're going to be really proud of that in due course um, once it's finalised. 
Um, as part of the Mind the Gap project, we did take part in the um, NHSE um, evaluation, which Liverpool's Moores University um, conducted, and they commented that actually they were really impressed with our durable outputs and the impact that the project is having on the wider ongoing aims of the trust to emphasise the needs of families and carers, and that actually we were trying to measure what mattered most to carers and hear from our carers. So we were proud of that, and actually we put in another bid for what they call embedding money, and we've been successful in that. So we'll have an ongoing project um, with the uh, veterans team. We've also completed the um, reaccreditation process for um, the triangle of care. Um, so we've uh, maintained our two stars for that. Um, ongoing engagement is, is carrying on and Carers UK are actually looking at that accreditation process. So it's likely to change in uh, 2023. Um, we've also talked about um, the Purple Network was mentioned a little bit earlier um, in May. I became the deputy chair of the Purple Network, which is for our staff with a long term condition, disability and um, those with caring responsibilities. So as part of the uh, Purple Network, we've set up a uh, working carers uh, network for our staff who are carers, because we also know that statistically they're more likely to be your more mature members of staff who's got that service with long-term service with you so we need to think about ways that we can support and engage with them um, we have got a teams channel up and running that we're sharing information and asking questions we're also looking to work with the well-being matters team um, they're going to be putting on some sessions specifically for um, working carers so that will be our staff and it's also going to be staff across the ics and i've worked with them on a questionnaire that's going to be going out to um to staff in the next week or two to get their feedback on what they'd want to see in those sessions to help their well-being um, with their caring responsibilities um, and various other um, uh, feedback into things like the flexible working policy, etc. as well. Um, what's in development? So the longer term projects looking at recording uh, on Rio things to do with carers and the feedback and the relationships. Um, so what we're looking at at the moment is developing some standard works in line with our uh, quality improvement initiatives to outline exactly what we do from a best practice point of view using the existing functionality of our uh, RIO, which I should explain is our electronic patient record system, and then looking to see where there might be gaps within that and what improvements might be made to at the moment, there's a lot of different ways across the trust that all the services record this information to see if we can have some commonality amongst themes and some um, guidance on, on best practice and updating things in due course um, as part of that. Uh, confidentiality from the feedback that we've had um, is uh, always an uh, or potentially an issue. Um, so what we're doing is looking at different ways to um, promote and make staff feel confident that they can have conversations with uh, carers and their families if they're unable to share information, but making sure that carers don't feel that that's just shutting down of a conversation, that you're able to um, share more generic information and, and have that conversation uh, with them. So that's a working, uh, there's various materials in development for that. Also looking at potentially some sort of bike hat size education pieces that could be shared with teams. Um, various other additional resources, as I say, what we want to do is work towards this toolkit so that um, services have things that they can adapt or adopt for their own needs within each area. Um, back in uh, June, we also held a couple of carers events because we want to co-produce a friends, family and carers charter. Um, so we had a virtual event with about 25 attendees and we had a face to face event with 30 plus. Um, so we got the care of feedback. We have um, reviewed and analysed that. Oops, gone too quickly with my clicks there. Um, created a draft, uh, a charter that's um, in the process of being circulated to the people that participated for some additional feedback. And the idea will be that we um, uh, promote and finalise that and launch it in line with Carers Rights Day in November. Uh, so really what's next is, as I mentioned, this toolkit for services and managers, make sure that we support services to meet the six standards that are in the strategy, enable the services to complete the self-assessment process in a more digitalised and uh, easier format, and then develop an, on that. Once we've got it more digitalised, it will make the reporting more easy for the future. Um, uh, so hopefully this time next year, I'll be able to give a bit more um, quantitative data rather than more of a qualitative uh, feedback approach and uh, continue to work with HR colleagues and the Purple Network to support our staff with caring responsibilities and continue to work on various other 
bespoke projects and promoting that um, engagement and communication with friends, family and carers. So that ultimately we're improving our patient and carers experiences. So that was a bit of a whistle stop tour. Um, any questions? Katie, that's fantastic. Really, really impressive questions. Paul. And I just want to say this is really impressive, Katie. And um, my big concern, um, which you've allayed, you said you'll be back here in a year's time because you're doing a great job. And uh, normally when something like this happens, as soon as governors are impressed, that person moves on to something else. And, um, <laughs> and of course, we want to see so we want to see some concrete results from this. And I guess my question to you is, do you feel you're getting full cooperation from the trust wide and from HR in relation to um, uh, engaging staff and, and, and educating staff about uh, the need for support of carers? Uh, yes, yes, no, I do. I, 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 I threw that bit in there because I did remember you asking me last year about whether everybody was uh, was engaged. So I, I, I hoped I was preempting your question. Um, okay. No, I, I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Um, it's from my point of view as an individual, it's really interesting to. Um, work with the different teams and understand and see all the great work across the I've worked for the trust for a number of years before but um you 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 do end up only seeing that bit that you're working with whereas I've got the luxury now of being able to engage and speak to lots of different teams and work with lots of great people so no I'm really lucky I'm really enjoying it and as long as they'll have me Paul I will be here next year good thank you <laughs> I'm sure we will Katie <laughs> Um, well, thanks. As Paul said, a great presentation and, and several of us, I'm sure, are carers uh, uh, on the call anyway and appreciate the, you know, the effort that's going into this. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Time is against us, I'm afraid, Katie, but thank you. Um, could we move on to uh, item 11, appointment of lead and deputy lead governors? We had a, a tightly fought campaign. Um, and uh, I'm pleased to announce that Brian Wilson will be the lead governor and John Wellham will be the deputy lead governor, taking over from Paul. So, so congratulations to you both. Look forward to working with you. And uh, I'd just like to repeat my thanks to Paul for the excellent work that Paul's done uh, over his uh, term of office. So thank you for that. Welcome. Um, governor feedback session. Uh, is there anything governors want to raise particularly that uh, we haven't discussed? Okay, any other business? My only other business is to ask it. Oh, sorry, Ros, you've got a... Sorry, it was just a quick one, Martin. No, please. Um, just to to ask if there's any decision on the results of the survey that we were all asked to complete about our preferences for in-person meetings or, um, or, or continuing online and, and what meetings are going to be in future, because I hadn't heard anything. Um, who's organising? I, I have seen it. I think it came out sort of 50 50, didn't it? That some did and some didn't, I think, but I've forgotten who organised it. Was Jenny it? did a survey. Sorry? Jenny. It was Jenny, Jenny who did Jenny, survey. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think, Martin, I think we're thinking about it'll be easier to do hybrid meetings once we're in our new building. You know, we're moving out of Fitzwilliam House um, at the end end of this this year. Then I think it'll be easier because there's still sort of issues about um, uh, very little um, parking. We've got parking over the road, but it's only for I think for two hours or something. So I think we can probably do um, hybrid meetings better in our new building. So I think that was a preference. I think there was no clear winner. I think people preferred option would be to have the option of either attending in person or on online. So we can look at um, we could we can um, discuss which meetings would work well as um, online meetings and which would work well as hybrid meetings. Perhaps, perhaps we could have this as a little item on an upcoming meeting, could we? Just so we, yeah. everyone has a chance to see it and we have a little discussion. I think that'd be the best way of doing it. Thanks. Thank Thank you very much. Uh, my only, only other business is to encourage you all to have your flu and COVID vaccines. I've had mine and I'm still here, so um, can't be all bad. Um, and the day, next meeting is the 2nd of November, which is the joint, the joint meeting, and the 7th of December, a formal council meeting. I think with that, 
we're done. Thank you to everyone who's taken part. Um, and don't forget, we have an AGM in person this afternoon at somewhere. I don't know where it is, but it's in Bracknell, but you all should have it on your address. <laughs> South Hill Park. Yeah. Oh, shall, uh, OK. Oh, someone's got their hand up. Sorry, is that? Uh, if I miss someone? Very briefly, Martin. In, John, yeah? Can you, yeah, very briefly in relation to the uh, booster vaccination. I had a very unfortunate experience at my local pharmacy, but my wife went to the mall in Reading and uh, she walked out within 10 minutes, not an hour and a half. So those right. of you who've still got to have their booster and neither has had the flu, then you might want to uh, learn from that. OK, thank you very much, John. <laughs> uh, OK, well, thanks so much then. And we'll, oh, sorry, it's another hand. Isabel. Yes, sorry. Thank you for that. Um, it's been really very interesting. Thank you. I haven't taken part. I have had my um, flu and COVID injections this morning, hence I was late. I'm sorry about that. Um, can I just say something? Because I am concerned about it. Yeah. When people know about the trusts and the hospitals, so they just think NHS and they don't necessarily identify the trusts, you know, the hospitals in that way. Um, just so you know, there are terrible um, things going on at Frimley Park and therefore so Heatherwood and it um, wakes some park. I haven't heard anything bad about the trust at all, but I just want you to be aware. I know there have been some major complaints put in at Frimley Park, but just so you're aware, because they've been sending for people where for appointments which don't exist. Um, there's all sorts of things, and just so that you are aware of it, because okay, I take the trust to get um, tainted with it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, and, and I, I hope, I'm sure we all hope that uh, Primley Park and Primley Health, I should say, um, address the issues. I'm sure they're working very hard on it right now, yeah. but thank you. Okay, well, let's um, look forward to seeing you all and coronation chicken sandwiches at lunch beforehand. My favourite. Um, uh, and with that, we'll close the meeting.